fourth meetup meeting on uh, Fabric. Talk a little bit about our experience with it. We, you know, we do a lot of software development for uh, uh, enterprises in the area. A couple of years ago or so, we got our head around, uh, started investigating um, uh, blockchain technology, not necessarily cryptocurrency, but the blockchain effects because of the, 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 the ways we heard on, on the impacts it made. Started doing some research on it and playing around with it, and that led us to Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, we liked it because it was open source. We liked it because IBM, you know, we, we've been, we worked with IBM in the past, and they're a big enterprise IT firm, so that led us to that direction. We liked the fact that it was a framework as opposed to uh, you know, a ready-made solution or platform like Ethereum or such. And so we started diving into it and ended up building our own little network. We have our own high you know, use case reference built up. Uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of customers in it yet. We have customers that are interested in proof of concepts, you know, kind of exploring the technology. So we do some training, talk about it, the use cases for it, but nothing full bore into production ready type of stuff other than our own. We've deployed it out on cloud and we have a, you know, so when the time comes that, you know, somebody needs some, some, uh, you know, hardcore assistance in, in, in deploying that work and understanding the moving parts, that's we'll have a knowledge base in that. So that's really where, why, how we got in touch with uh, uh, Hyperledger, the Linux Foundation. We also have a framework in there. We have one the shameless plug. We have an open source tool called uh, Byzantine Config, which is a tool for Fabric on how, uh, there's a lot of, uh, uh, Administration involved, uh, managing certificates, update transactions. If, you know, those of you familiar with Fabric, you know, to update it, you have to execute a tra update some transaction to update the configuration of blockchain. So we built a tool around that to ease that, right? So that's how we got in with the, uh, the Linux Foundation. We have one of our projects out there in open source. So we've just been talking about it. We, uh, we just get together and talk about the technology around Fabric specifically. That's our, our meetup uh, today. I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about how, how assuming you have a, a blockchain consortium in place and how client would interact with it, right? So hypothetically, if there was some kind of you know, supply chain, uh, blockchain group of organizations out there participating in consortium of some sort, all doing their business, right? Transactions are being shared, you know, there's distributed data is being out there. Well, that means in, in reality that, that there's more to it than just that, right? I mean, these transactions are all going to be flown through the, you know, out there in, in, available uh, for Query or update or execution or what have you, um, how are they going to be integrated into, into an application, right? Um, I just kind of want to talk about that. Our thoughts on it, it's not going to be very detailed, it's kind of high level. We can have a discussion. If you guys have any any uh, uh, experience with it, chime in, we can just you know, go through it. So I just going to, um, so that's why I'm called distributed apps, um, Hyperledger Fabric. And, you know, there's this idea of a single source of truth. And most organizations maintain a single source of truth in the form of some kind of data store. Probably most traditionally nowadays, some kind of relational data store of some sort. Um, you know, one big giant single source of truth within their wall, within their confines, and they have, and many, many applications will be accessing this, right? So you'll have a single source of truth, could be on a mainframe, it's older school, could be more modern, DB2, SQL Server, uh, you name it. An enterprise is going to have this. Going to have a staff of people, DBAs, usually that are going to be maintaining it, enforcing it, making sure the, the rules, that, the constraints, uh, the entities, the die all represent their business, right? And that's changing a little bit. Um, you know, interestingly enough, the distributed type of programming is is what we're finding is where companies are starting to break up that single source of truth within their walls. That would lead us to microservice type architectures that we were seeing. Traditionally, we'd read monolithic applications that would talk to the single source of truth and perform some kind of operations on it. Maybe multiple applications, monolithic applications point to it. Um, the latest trend is in breaking that up into more of a microservice, aka distributed platform, where lots of smaller grain services are talking to it. And for that to work, they're breaking up that single source of truth into distributed databases, right, within the confines of the wall. That's, that's another topic. Talk about it, but it is relevant to blockchain because the idea behind blockchain is distributed also, and it's a single source of truth um, that is outside of an organization walls, right? So you think of a blockchain as a enforceable, uh, trustworthy, omnipotent data store that is a single source of truth, but it's outside the organization walls, right? They can still maintain that it's across organization boundaries. Um, 
So sharing and integration. So um, the single source of truth is residing in two different organizations. I have a little example here where uh, APIs, EDI, so on and so forth are all used to share information. So this uh, single source of truth data is copied to another organization's boundaries. And that's their single source of truth now. So it's copy, copy, copy. That's done through, through this kind of what, very simple diagram here. We got, this is a, uh, I made this up, so I don't know how accurate it is, uh, but it's a, a patient, imagine a hospital or a healthcare organization that has patient information, billing information, visits, lab, that there's gonna be a single source of truth of this somehow, maybe not be this design, but labs um, that uh, typically most hospitals won't, won't perform their own labs, they'll send it off to Quest or some other diagnostic center, right? So that means that, that if the sample is set over to them, they perform the work, they blah, 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 and then the lab is somehow, that information is, is brought to the hospital. Old days it was keyed in. Right now some kind of EDI, some kind of API, some kind of file download, some kind of file transfer is doing it. So when that happens, we've just duplicated it, right? I mean, it's, it's in this database of, of some structure. The organization that wants to consume it can, can get it, but every organization that's consuming it is going to put it into their single source of truth however they want to do it. So that's how kind of what's happening nowadays. This is where blockchain can fit in to data sharing, right? This is a use case that we see a lot of upside with, we believe it, because we do a lot of work in this previous slide, right? We have over the years integration, you know, moving data between organizations and entities. Um, this is where I get excited from a, as being an architect that uh, if we had a, uh, a blockchain implementation, um, we have a single source of truth here across organization boundaries, right? The labs, the, the diagnostic center, and all the hospitals and health uh, entities participated in this blockchain, they participated in it, then there would be one single source of truth. As labs were performed, they, in near real-time fashion, they'd be available to everything and everybody else via blockchain technology. Uh, the blockchain um, uh, technology would make it trustworthy. Um, it would be a permission one, of course, um, in this case. But this is where, uh, as subtle as that is, in the picture, it's, it's a pretty powerful concept. Because the, the conjecture is that if this network was robust enough and enough participants in it, the IT cost would be lower. The diagnostic center may not have to stand up tons of servers, sharded databases, failover, blah, blah, and keep that up alive 7 by 24. There's still server software that they have to maintain, but if the network's big enough, collaboratively, it's going to be, theoretically, more uptime, less cost and computing power, and less duplication of data, which is the biggest thing, right? The data, when they put lab results into the blockchain, they originate it, it'll be available to everybody, and that will be the source the source of truth across organization boundaries. So that's, that's kind of where uh, we get excited about it. The type of data that's going to go in here is it's going to be unlikely that an organization is going to put their entire database in the blockchain. We're talking about global data, data that means something to the organization or consortium, right? In the case, labs means something, but information like billing information, customer information, that, that doesn't reside in this global single source of truth because it doesn't mean it means different things to different people. So the way we see uh, blockchain data fitting into client enterprise applications is going to be this, this data that's identified as being global. It means something that everybody will reside in some kind of um, blockchain, but everything else will still business as usual, right? So we don't see blockchain technology eliminating DB2 or Oracle or any traditional database models. We see it fitting into it, right? And it's really just an alternative way to share data, replacing the EDIs, placing the ETL uh, file download, or things like that, right? Now there's a lot of other corner cases with that, for performance, things like that. But conceptually, that, that sharing of data, you know, through any kind of organization's workflow, it's powerful. So right now, what I read about is um, supply chain, right? Because that makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of parties involved, you know, and what we're, they're finding is just by sharing data, by saying it's going in from, you know, they have some device that takes something off of a cargo ship into a warehouse, onto a train, all the way to result, they can track that the whole way through this shared technology, blockchain technology. They eliminate costs because what they're finding is all that stuff's keyed in by hand typically when it goes from warehouse or whatever, scanned it, mistakes happen. So just by deploying the blockchain framework, the, the 
folks that have done a supply chain that can tell you uh, they're saving money, not necessarily on technology stack, but more on less errors, right? No errors because it's going all the way through. They're not going to this uh, vendor that says, well, we don't, have a, we don't have the bandwidth to suck down this EDI or just any kind of API call. We're just going to, at a terminal, we're going to key it in, right? We'll make a mistake. And then reconciling those mistakes costs a lot of money. If they all participate in the blockchain, there's no less mistakes because it's all digitized. It's people aren't keystroking it in. So that's, that's the early outcome of some of the supply chain um, use cases that folks have seen that, that have uh, been successful with. So where we see the uh, blockchain fitting into the enterprise. Um, the down, and and I've, I've talked about this before. That this is easy on pictures and easy in concept. The, tech, the technology's there. I mean, the blockchain, data structure, the peer-to-peer -peer gossiping, all that stuff is proven and it works and it's great, it's, it's getting everybody on board. It's going to be more of a human problem, more of an organization problem, more of a leadership problem than the technology problem. Technology is here. I think it's time is now. But trying to go and get everybody involved and everybody using it, that's that's difficult. That, that's the biggest barrier. Go. Yeah. What's the access time of uh, like doing a SQL select on a local database versus going to your fabric network? Well, that's a really good question. Um, uh, it's going to be probably slower, I would think, um, and so it's going to be. I always use the word near real time, not real time, and so that's going to also limit you. You know, a, a supply chain or a lab results doesn't have to be real time. A trading platform, probably not a good idea, right? I mean, I don't know if that's going to work. There's latency involved. This is a this is what you call an eventual consistency type of architecture, to where the network is going to eventually reach consensus. The, 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 the transactions and blocks are going to go through eventually. So you are going to have to probably apply this to a virtual consistency type use cases as opposed to real time stuff. So the stock trading platform, I wouldn't, I wouldn't suggest that. You're going to get that to your point. Well, that's a good question. So I would agree the customer ID may be out there or maybe some kind of universal identifier of some sort, right? I, there's still going to be this compromise uh, or architecture where some for online processing or um, metrics or things like that, it may have to copy that data, right, in the traditional data warehousing type thing. So in certain cases that you brought up, which is valid, that, you know, you may have to say, you know what, for reporting purposes and things like that, we may need to make a copy of that. So, so how I would do it, I mean, you jerk, if I had a situation where I had um, lab information out there and I needed to look at, uh, do a lot of summary of labs, you know, uh, for number crunching for maybe some university entity gets access to labs, they want to do some kind of crunching of the numbers to see effectiveness, I don't know, I don't know the terminology, but they, maybe they have something like that. They could query the blockchain and do that, or what I would recommend is they would ETL it to their own local and then do the work. I mean, that's gotta copy anyway. Gotta copy, but it's a copy for reporting. It's not a single source of truth. Uh, and then when you do this extraction from your fabric network back to your own database, do you have to go from block one all the way up to block two million? Because no. how do you know which block it's in? Do you have any index? Yeah, you do. Yeah, so in, in, in Fabric, there's a, it's fronted with a couch DB. Nice thing about Fabric that for perform for that reason there is you don't query the block store. The block is a is the, the blockchain is stored in the blockchain on the file device of a peer node, right? I'm getting technical here, but Fabric has a fronting couch DB. By default, has couch DB. It's a key store uh, database, or you could put the sander in there, or you could any other key value store. And it maintains the latest information per transaction, not by block. You don't need it by block. But if you remember, this is an append only ledger. So if I have some kind of identifying key, which I have to have, and I have information, and then I mutate that, and I mutate that, and I mutate that, the history is could be relevant. Really, what we care about typically is the latest greatest. That's going to be in a every in a high performance CouchDB database. That you don't have to actually query, you can do complex queries and or Boolean logic, all kinds of stuff to meet your needs. And that's that's part of fabric. Why well, I wouldn't I wouldn't put customer information in the blockchain. I, so in this diagram, all I'm, this is their stuff. The only thing I'm putting in the blockchain is the lab results. That's it, just the labs. Consortium. The consortium. So the information that everybody cares about goes in the blockchain. Customer information, billing information, business as usual. No, I don't change anything there. DB2. Whatever you're using now, there's no. It's only the global information that's blockchain. So, I don't. Re we don't recommend putting everything in the blockchain for the reason you're pointing out, right? I mean that. I mean, and plus it's different to everybody because my customer information and numbers and schemes and rates and blah blah is totally different than 
Organ A, but information that we should care about is the lab information that's common to all. Now, this could be the hospital, it could be the CDC, it could be uh, a practitioner, it could be you know whoever, a person. That's in the blockchain. That's what's shared, distributed. Everything else is business as usual. And that's the kind of the point I'm making from the, the presentation is how do we integrate this? I think some people may think, and I understand that because I kind of think, oh, a blockchain replaces their database system. It does not. It's just global information that they, that they, that they care about. So, uh, uh, John, John, was it? I think your, your question is valid, but the key is the, there's going to be overhead here, but just going to be, hopefully, I would think, I would, if I was going to design this, I would say, I don't want a lot of data. I want the minimum that's global to everybody else. And there's maybe some identifiers in there that we all agree upon or you can use. That's the, that's the hard part, that, that modeling of what we put in there. But don't put your old database on that. You know, it, it's just not going to perform. Now, Couch is a very, very fast, key value, low latency, you know, uh, database, right? But you don't, you don't have relational integrity. You don't have any of that stuff in it. So it's not a candidate for your traditional type of, of uh, data store. I leave those alone. Leave you two, super server, uh, whatever you're using. But just identify this. And again, that's the hard part, right? That's hard. How do we everybody on the same page to do this? So Walmart does it because they have a hammer. They say, oh, you want to sell lettuce to us? You're using our blockchain. That's the only way you can, okay, 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 we'll do it. You know, and they'll participate. So some, some places can do that. Um, other ones are going to be too competitive, right? I mean, who's going to, and you brought who owns it, who does it? Well, I don't know. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it's going to have to be some kind of steward of this. The association is going to have to say, okay, we've got to stand these nodes up. Okay, we got to when we make a transaction, we got to call the node, who owns it, who sets it up. That's, that's maybe someday we'll be able to help out, but that, that's got to be identified, right? I know there's some companies out there that will do it for you, custodians of the blockchain, right? But that's got to be established by the consortium. And again, that's hard. That's an organization. That's not technology. We have a blockchain network that's super resilient. We got nodes in Azure. We got a node in EC2. We got a couple orders, you know, consent all of them. So it's not going down, and it will work. It will so many, it's going to cost. It costs us to put it out there, and it costs us to maintain it. It's not free, right? And so, um, and since it's permissioned, I've got to manage certificates. I got to say who's going to has access, who doesn't have access. So somebody's got to fill in that void, and that's what you're going to see companies like IBM doing, uh, maybe us uh, or others, right? That need to do that. Or some consortium is going to say, okay, here's the money for our blockchain initiative because this blockchain is going to save us money as a whole. You know, so let's all pony up some money. Let's get this going. Let's get somebody to come in and set up our network, and then we'll all use it and be happy together. And all those politics and stuff that goes along with that. that. That's how I see it coming. And that's why I think some people that are predicting blockchain is going to take a couple years for it to go. It's not a killer app that you can use right away. You Cryptocurrency is this. Big entities. Um, uh, this came out um, uh, this, the supply chain up in Canada. Companies are saving tons of money on less mistakes, right? Because the blockchain allows them to do that because it's one database that they're all sharing, right? It's not API after API after API, so they're losing mistakes because in a, in a given supply chain, I don't know how many vendors you have touching it and stuff like that. That's a lot of API calls. That's Which a lot chain of they use it. Are um, they using Hyperfabric? Hyper and they have a company up there that is not IBM. It's a company that's a steward for it. And they and they are running a countrywide, Canada-wide truck transportation, and it may even be the Canadian government somehow. Uh, supporting this with 12 nodes. So they got 12 peer nodes up, a couple of so they, they have indicated that it doesn't take a ton of computing infrastructure to support this hot, entire blockchain um, supply chain, right? So it is very cheap. And in, in, to your experiment or your, your idea, it's one API. It's, it's, it's into the blockchain that you've got about to show you. Yeah, so that's it. It's not everybody having to set their own database up, suck it down their own on one API, you know, that, that replicates out really, really fast. So it's a hole that adds up. So that's that will be the argument. So that's where it fits in. Fabric blockchain recap. So talk about fabric, how it works really briefly here because I, I could talk for a long time on it. It's a beautiful distributed uh, append-only ledger. We all know that. Uh, the consensus out of the box is Kafka. It's voting-based. It's Byzantine fault tolerant, but not Byzantine consensus. It's not a, it's not a uh, uh, consensus mechanism, right? So. PKI enforced identity and trust. As we know, Fabric is a permission, meaning everybody's got to have an identity, have a, a certificate to access. It's not an open, um, public type of blockchain. I think Ethereum, anybody's Ethereum, it, it's, it's both. You can do it, configure it however you want. 
and then the logic smart contract is also distributed. So the nice thing about you know a smart contract chain code is one of the same smart contract is you know I think of of um, it as um, Fabric calls it chain code, code, but basically it's distributed logic. You know, you can, you know, the, the fabric blockchain is not a single purpose debit, credit, cryptocurrency, data store. It's whatever you want it to be. It's whatever data you want to store out there. The size of data, you can, if that's putting data out there, you can apply um, application logic, business logic, whatever you, you want. And that we call that chain code, and that's also part of the blockchain. Um, and it gets executed. Uh, based on parameters, right? So you can think of it as stored procedure or whatever you want, but in many cases, it, in many cases, it may be just putting information into the blockchain, but sometimes based upon who you are and other parameters, you'll want to share logic. Fabric has a, uh, a platform that is, allows you to use non-deterministic logic, such as J uh, languages such as Java, JavaScript, Go. These are non-deterministic non languages. Uh, and it's because their endorsing mechanism, um, they you set up endorsers, they compare and contrast, you have to digitally sign these results, they compare them for validity, right? So that way, something like Ethereum has, a, has to use its own solidity language because it's deterministic. They take away all their um, uh, you know, random number generators, anything, so when you execute a function in solidity, you can guarantee it's gonna always be that result wherever it's executed. And that's why they had to rip out all the other JavaScript stuff that's deterministic, right? They have a non-deterministic language. So um, in, we can use deterministic languages because of its endorsing mechanism of Fabric. You can you, you execute the thing. It can, it can read from the latest state of the blockchain what it's going to write, its execution. That payload is compared and, and co assigned and compared to make sure that there's no deterministic log logic in there and there's a bad result. So that, that's kind of a neat feature of, and it's performance feature, because instead of running on every node, if I have chain code that, uh, let's say I have 20 peer nodes out there, all sitting out there, and I have to, you know, it's something like um, Ethereum, that, that chain code or smart contract has to run on every node to reach consensus when it applies the, block, the data to, the, to, to its local block store. Well, with, with Fabric, if I have two or three endorsers, I only execute that that, that time, so I get a lot quicker response time. So there's there is a performance factor in fabric smart code mechanism, right? I don't know how big that would be, but it, it's, I don't have to. If I have a giant network, I don't have to run that smart contract in every node. I only run it on the endorsing nodes, which are configurable, and that gives you a, a pretty good performance. And it's it's distributed, right? So this is the picture. That's topology. You've probably seen this. You know, we have peer nodes. I've got order. This is one I probably got, you know, so I have the order is the mechanism that is uh, um, taking the blocks and disseminating the updates and new blocks, you know, block cutting, cuts a block through the gossip structure, sends it out to the nodes. The gossip structure is, you know, um, more technical for what we need to talk about today, but just know it works like any other distributed. It's going to go ahead and it can communicate what's going on and it just propagates through the network, right? The blocks are copied. If I were to stand up a peer node, like any blockchain implementation, I would, if I, was, if I had the right digital certificate and I could do it, it would talk to the order and the order would give me all the blocks and I would, all the blocks would come down to me. So every node has a whole block store. Like I said earlier, it's fronted by CouchDB. Every node has a CouchDB. Think of it as a cache, I guess would be a good way to do it. That, that cache is, it's a persistent cache that has the latest transaction information, right? I'm not, I'm not having to query a block so I can get it that quickly and it, 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 the uh, fabric keeps that in sync with the with the blocks in the blockchain um, and then I have a, a certificate of authority that's just an, implying that everything is you know TLS to node to node so it's uh, uh, transport layer security between the nodes all the communications are digitally signed by a valid entity and to get connection the identity is all identified by a, a, a public key encryption and you have to have that to, to, to work with fabric. This is what we're going to talk about today, the node. They have SDKs for Node, Go, and Java. So these are SDKs. This is what we were talking about earlier. So this is the blockchain running out there in these labs, so people that want to interact with it and they're from their enterprises would stand up one of these SDKs in the language of their choice. And it, it's going to have a, and they'll have a digital certificate so they connect to the peer node, and they'll have, they can communicate with whatever peer node they want to query or execute or do whatever they interact with the, with the blockchain, right? So this is how I have this consortium out there. I have this, you know, Canadian supply chain implementation. And I come on board and let's say I'm 
deliver packages or something, and I'm a part of the supply chain, um, and I have to interact with it, I would have to go get an SDK, get credentials, and then I could go ahead and see orders and stuff coming in, you know, bill of lading or bill of material or whatever. I'm able, I would have to interact with the that way. Right? Now, that, 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 what we're talking about, that's, I have the SDK and I can talk to it. I think that's cheaper than standing up databases of code, calling an API, bringing it down, integrating it. Instead, I'm just going to say, oh, I need an SDK. Here's the contract. I can call and do stuff with it. I'm off the I still have to have a server, right? So I'm not saying it's not there, but I have to have a little less work. And plus, I can rely upon that information and interact with it. And then I would interact that. I'd get that information. It still would. It would still work in my line of business, right? So that's. This is what. Uh, this is the client access mechanism. Again, this is Node here, uh, but you can use Go or, or Java. It could be C sharp. I don't know, but I don't see any reason why not because this is just. Um, gRPC, right? So the other thing I like about Fabric is all this communication is going using protocol buffer technically, but gRPC, it's Google, it's Google's RPC, and it's very, very, very performant. We've done some tests, and it smokes standard HTTP, JSON, serialization, all that kind of stuff that we do. It's very fast, very, very, very fast. And it's, it's a protocol buffer, so they're, they're basically, it's hard to explain, but it's a, it's a, it's a, the only information that comes across is a structured buffer. And so it gives them super, super high performance. So, and John, to your question, the gRPC gives you a little bit of a hit, a little faster hit than just standard HTTP using serializing JSON or whatever you're going across with. It's pretty dang fast. So, one more quick question. Um, if only a couple of your nodes are, are uh, running the contract, and right. they verify and say, okay, everything's, everything's fine, and so we're going to add it to the chain. Then what does your what's your confirmation time? Um, I think that's going to be I don't I don't have any numbers on that. I mean it depends on how many um, orders and how many nodes are in your network, right? I mean so it's going to and, and the number of the number of confirmations is is configurable. So this is a framework. So um, I don't have a hard number on that, but it's going to be um, if I have I'm, I'm always going to have at least two endorsing nodes for safeness and at least you know two um, Kafka instances for uh, uh, not scalability but for performance, right? In case one's down or has two, I can load balance between them. If I'm going to go from my gut, um, I don't think it's going to be any slower than, you know, you, you're all going to be subject to the whim of your network, right? They're, they're recommending like really small blocks, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So we're recommending, well, you can configure the block size, and that's another good question, right? Because, you know, you can tune the block size for that. So there's all these tuning things. So I just don't know. If I can, you know, with Bitcoin, you have a live production system with lots of nodes and actual transactions happening right now, so they can give you a consensus, you know, 10 minutes or whatever. I can, t I can tell you it's going to be quicker than 10 minutes. I'll guarantee you that. <laughs> you know, um, uh, you know, reach consensus. I can, like, isn't it just a couple seconds? Yeah. If that? I mean, you may, I, I, I'll Google it. If you Google fabric transaction time, I mean, there, there's production fabric systems out there to tell you. But I, I think, you know, I don't think there's going to be a problem with performance. I really don't. I mean, and you, there's ways to scale it. I mean, you know, block size, number of nodes, you know, number of orders you set up. So it's, it's built to be. And then using gRPC, which is pretty dang fast, wire to wire type communication. It doesn't get much faster. You know, it's, you know, it's like we're all IP, but it's got some structure around it. So I don't, I don't think, I think Fabric is performant. I also think the cache up front and the blocks, you know, and this is going to lead to the next question everybody always has, and I don't have a great answer for it. There are ways in Fabric to delete and clone and, and prune your stuff because you have a giant blockchain network and everybody has a copy of it, right? It's going to grow forever, right? Well, my answer, which is kind of glib, is that, is that first off, we're going to really promote not giant normalized structures in the blockchain. We're, we're, we want to promote pretty flat transactions, I hope. That's what I would encourage. You know, very information that's not, you know, didn't have relationships and normalized, I wouldn't recommend that. So it's going to be tight, quick information that's going to be super speedy and zap right through the network. As that grows with Fabric, you can, you can cut blocks and make things, you know, back it up and whack it so it, it shrinks, right? If you don't need it anymore. There, there are, you can do that, but that's, there's not a real thing. It is going to, it is going to, you're going to have to pay attention to it because if you get a lot of adoption, you're going to have a lot of, you know, transactions through the day, well, it's going to grow, so you got to manage that, right? 
But again, it's glib. You know, uh, this drive is pretty cheap. Access to it is pretty cheap, right? I mean, it's Find access, let's talk about it. So this is a, a more detailed picture of it. Um, uh, they can register to roll in the pier. So here's, a, here's, a, here's kind of a, a, an example of uh, microservice architecture, very, very high level. I've got my React UI or any UI, Angular, React, I don't care. So mobile app, tablet, who cares uh, here. Talking to some kind of API server that's serving up for an application, let's say, or for a gateway like MuleSoft or something like that in an enterprise. And that, that API gateway of sort, some sort of server is going to go ahead and farm out to services, servicing this app. That could be a service here that goes to a traditional database, whatever you're going to, customer information or whatever, as usual, or a piece of it could go to um, a peer node. So this information for this service is, is getting its um, data stored from the blockchain. Right? So that's how you can synthesize in blockchain data with traditional enterprise data for some kind of, U, for some kind of um, UI application, right? You grab the SDK, um, you know, this, you could, a monolithic implementation would have everything in here. We're recommending a more of a, of a microservice to where this is just aggregating the API calls and calling out to different services to do different things. And then and, and we'll probably have a service that's gonna be responsible for interacting with your blockchain. Okay, so that's the, that's kind of the, how we would Architect it again, very high level, but that's how we would engage a, um, a peer node in the, in the blockchain. Um, so that's kind of <laughs> it's not a very long presentation, but that is what um, uh, what we're playing around with, right? So we have a um, our implementation is of what I just talked about. And you can get to it, and again, this is a shameless plug, but it's, it's open sourced for the most part. We have this, I think this is up. Here's uh, what I'm just talking about. This is uh, our uh, React app talking to an API server, and that API server is, is getting these lab results. This is what's in our blockchain, in our founder blockchain. These are just, uh, imagine these are flu results, right? So if I want to add a result, you know, that's the data we have in there. So, you know, these are just, uh, so the theory here is, is if people participated in this, it's a CDC, diagnostic centers, doctor's offices, hospitals, when any somebody got the flu or a mobile app, if I got the flu, I could say, oh, I got the flu, right? I could call this API, this API, this API I'm calling from a mobile app is the blockchain. It's calling, it's calling a server we have out in the cloud. That API um, cloud is um, server is calling the blockchain and putting in the lab results or querying the lab results to get them back. And, and then the other information we have is like the list of counties and other information that's not in the blockchain. That's just in our normal database. Okay? So this is an example of integrating with the blockchain, right? The, 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 these lab results are available by anybody that wants to query the blockchain and do whatever they want with it. Right? So imagine right now I know that I believe how they track the flu is they do Google searches and do kind of stuff and the CDC publishes numbers, delayed, stuff like that. Imagine if I went into my doctor's office and said, they swapped my, my thing and they went into their system from Cerner or Epic or whoever they use and added this, it would just call this API and put it out there, right? They would, they have, they have an API call. They would say, oh, we'll keep this information. We'll also say Dave Pitt's got the flu, what type is it, his age, goes out just for the greater good. The CDC can pull that information, or as they do it, if it's coming from a permission provider like the flu, like the doctor's office, or hospital, or the state human health resources, or whatever, their permission and they're doing it, you're going to get pretty close to real time, you know, flu coming across, right? And it would work, right? Instead of guessing, you just see it, the flu come across, right? As it happened. Or people. You can even trust it. You say, you know, it takes a grain of salt, but I could put a little app here that allows, and that would, that this number gets one chance. And I mean, you, yes, people could lie, or maybe we say this was worth just kind of, I got the flu, right? And maybe an app that encourages somebody that for the results, so maybe they get something for it, so they can, you know, encourage them to use it. But anyway, you see how that blockchain data would, would work out really well, as opposed to the CDC. You know, right now they have they have this information, they collect it, 
Um, they get it reported by all the, they have to um, key it in, or they call it, somehow it's getting copied all the way into the CDC, or maybe it's just formed and they scan it in. Well, it wouldn't have to do that. Again, it's hypothetical. For this to happen, it would be probably difficult organizational-wise, but technology is there. It would not take a lot to, to, to make this, you know, uh, somebody's got to maintain it and care and feed it, but it would, technology-wise, this information would be, you know, and it, it would, you know, theoretically, maybe it's worth investing in. What's the, what's the savings? Well, the quicker we know about the flu and people get prepared, the overall cost of society goes down, right? People aren't sick and less work days, blah, 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 right? So anyway. So when I mean, you said that you got to get everyone to buy into this, yeah. to, to input all that data in there, I mean, is that going to be much different than you know everybody that trying to convince like everyone to just upload that to Cerner's information or whoever is currently having that? You, you could, but I mean, the problem is that it's, it's, it with that is in the, the information they have to copy it around. Right, right now they can just participate, and, it, and as it goes there, it's there, but it would be, and we were talking about this earlier, it'd be less than saying, okay, you need to go get your program and call Cerner's API. Okay. Like so, what happens is if if Cerner says we're doing this, we're setting up a server. They could, and here's our greater good database. We got a database here. Cerner's going to set up a bunch of load balancers. They got to cover the world, right? They got to cover the world. So they're going to they're going to have to invest in a very robust structure, more so than just a, a blockchain network, right? Okay. And set that all up, right? But they may do it. They may say we got the bucks. We do a lot of PR for this. Well, that means the CDC has to call that API and bring the data down and do something. And every other organization can do it. With, with this, it's there. They can call it. They can still look at that information, but they don't have. They have to do less IT of working with it, right? So, yes, they could. There's nothing preventing them technically from doing any of that kind of stuff. It's just, and plus, um, there still could be errors. They got to copy it down, put it in their database, and do something with it. They go. What happens if you know Cerner's not up, or they got to trust Cerner? The other thing is the trustless thing here. When this is with Cerner, if anybody trusts Cerner. Is this accurate coming in right? Are they putting it in right with their software? Is Epic giving it to them right if they're not? If somebody, if the CDC says, uh-uh, government regulation, here's our blockchain. We believe in blockchain as being accurate. You know, what's added there is, is yeah, that, I guess that's those same concerns yeah. about that that information getting uploaded into the, on the blockchain being accurate too. Right. right? But and if it's an immutable ledger with that, you know, what would you do with inaccurate information well, that gets uploaded? Well, so it, it, if, 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 so the, the theory would be, um, the CDC or the government says, Epic, Cerner, and if you want to be a healthcare provider like the Medical Records Act, you're going to go ahead and, you know, put this information in the blockchain. So here's your certificate, here's your here's your node, and if um, they would have to be trustworthy, right? You have to trust Cerner and Epic that mm -hmm. they're going to go ahead and in their software when you when they put a test result thing that's going to go ahead and make that call. You you, yes. you, you can trust that as them, guaranteed as them. Nobody's going to be a man in the middle. Nobody's going to tamper with it. But if the technician types it in wrong, it's in wrong. Garbage in garbage out, right? But mm -hmm. but you can trust that if, if it's the communication from Cerner into the blockchain is tamper proof, right? Nobody's going to tamper. With it. I mean, it's possible to tamper with that, uh, mess with it once it's in. But you know, if somebody reports a result that the blockchain can't fix that, yeah. right? Yeah, but, I guess I, that's where I've always yeah. seen more of the downside on the enterprise level is with you know. Uh, uh, with, you know, data, with, with doing it uh, for logistics and anything like that is you're still not preventing the bad info in and you know once in if it's accurate and correct then so that's where that's experience. where the IOT devices come in mm -hmm. so what what they're doing in these site thing is they're not just having each one type into their system that goes into the blockchain because it's the same problem they're enabling IOT devices so you're going scan okay no human in in the blockchain it's available to the next, right? That's the other thing I didn't point out is Fabric has a way to push, right? So, so when something's added, it will it can broadcast, right? That's just a it's just a mechanism in IT. It says, oh, I'm up my blockchain something, so you can sense when things are added to it. So, it's just a common solution that everybody uses with a trustworthy, immutable, tamper-proof database, right? I mean, so you could use existing. I could set up a regular database and do the same thing, right? But the blockchain technology, everybody in part is going to say, I, I, I believe that it's trustworthy, right? If we're all competitors here, right? Epic and Cerner, you know, that, you know that's, that's kind of the idea behind the blockchain database behind it, that it's immutable and it's unhackable, right? So we can say that it, it may be more, lab results may not be, who cares, who wants to fake that, right? With some foreign government wants to, 
mess with our whatever. Mm -hmm. But in a supply chain where vendors and competitors are in there, they need to say, yes, so-and-so John came up and scanned that cargo of lettuce, and it, was, it went from here to here. Well, everybody says, that's what happened. You gotta pay the bill. There's no mistake, right? Or, you know, I, that, that's where they're seeing the value of it, right? So you can still do that with existing technology. Blockchain doesn't change that. Mm -hmm. Really, the thing about, the thing about blockchain that solves the problem is the peer-to-peer -peer distributed nature of it, right? It's solved. You know, that centralized copying out, it's distributed, right? The, the, the way it's like Napster or some peer-to-peer -peer, uh, peer -peer technologies, and the blockchain data structure is, it, is the, the, the block hash blocks the transactions, the previous block is makes it tamper proof. That's really the, the technology we're talking about that we think is valuable. So it's not like, oh, you can't do it any other way. It's just what people get excited about is the peer-to-peer, -peer, which is performance, and, and cheaper and more efficient. And you know, um, with that with that Cerner idea we talked about, where Cerner has to set up this giant database and APIs calling it, they have to back it up and do stuff like that. Theoretically, if you have a blockchain network, Cerner has a node, and so does Epic has a node, and somebody else has a node, and maybe two or three nodes out here, maybe some uh, third party that says, you know, we'll, we'll maintain this for you for security. We'll set up a couple of nodes over here, just and we'll make sure they're up and running. Who gets back anything up? Mm -hmm. Because unlikely for them all to crash, right? That's the other idea behind it. And then from like the logistics side, what do you what do you do on disputes as far as like delivery delivery disputes? I mean, if um, you know if you're uploading this all to a shared database, but you know this guy's saying I shipped you know 50 cases of pork, and this guy's saying I received 48. So which one gets uploaded, the 50 or 48? Well, so so, so, as, so what's happening is they'll realize that every step that happened, that that single database is being updated, single, not copies. So okay. so as things are happening in the supply chain, hopefully through some kind of IoT device, right? Scanner, RFID, whatever. As soon as that happens, it's there, right? So there's, you know, the, 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 the single source of truth tells you what, what's going on. Okay, okay. I guess you're just What's that? Why not record both? That's what really happened. And then as you resolve it later, then you record the resolution. Yeah, no, so that's easy. So I do, I do know, I just read this that, I, I'll, you know, maybe we'll post it on the Hot Miller thing, but there was, I read a, uh, a release, I think it was a Canadian firm, they implemented a supply chain for trucking, mm -hmm. and they instantly saved money because of, of the manual mistakes that they've eliminated, because it's, it's just, as they're doing it, it's going right into the single source of truth, and they're, they're, they're saving lots of money. It's because there's mistakes that are made, and, and, and Resolute has gone way down because everybody's like participating saying, it says this, that's it. I mean, there's no dispute yeah, I guess you're still, I guess you still have to wait for the RFID technology to get to where it can scale the smaller cost products. I mean, are they doing it just yeah. because, yeah, I mean, I know, you know, from uh, uh, like food products or cases or something yeah. that get shipped in, it's people manually counting it. So the whole I, I don't know how, the, I, I do know, I mean, you'll see out there that IoT is a big, a big proponent of, of, of that, of, of blockchain because of all that information mm -hmm. going out. You know, I don't know. I mean, I know I know Walmart has um, um, all. The, if you want to sell lettuce to Walmart, you have to be participating in, the, in their fabric blockchain implementation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they're doing out there in California. Some of these with lettuce. I don't know if they are tying it into a console or they got them. I don't know. I don't I mean, I don't have an answer to that. I'm sure they're. You know, they they may just be typing it in, and if they type it in wrong, it's wrong. Um, or maybe they have some kind of bar, you know, barcode or something. Yeah, because I've, I've worked for a manufacturer, and I know I've, I've uh, food, and I know that we'd always get through disputes of, all right, but my distributor says there are 48 cases, and we're yeah. like, well, our records show 50, right. and you know, it just became, all right, well, who's going to be able to prove it? No one can, and then we end up just eating. Well, that's exactly. Or, I think I think if you if you successfully implement that, that could go away. That could be the play. But how do you get it? RFID or something has to be there to yeah. digitally like actually understand what's on. Or the transparency, or when you say you ordered, so remember, you say you ordered 50, and when as soon as you're, remember this is a distributed public, not public, but everybody sees it as it happens. Mm -hmm. as it, every event happens, you see it. So when you put your order in, as soon as it happens, you see it, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It comes to you, so you would have an event on your, on your saying, I want to listen for this. When I see this order number, I need to make sure it's matched up. It doesn't, you instantly say, ah! Ship wrong. Well, I guess right. what would happen is, you know, we have, they put the order in, you know, we say, all right, 50 cases went on the truck, the third party logistics says, we got 50 cases. They take well, it into no. the distributor who says, 
there were 50 cases, but the distributor says we counted 48. And then it's like, well, who? You know, well, that where, would be, where yeah, and that would cases? happen as soon, that event would be, the whole supply chain would know that immediately, right? So if you ordered 50 cases down a supply chain, you ordered at your manufacturing facility, and you were participating in the blockchain, uh, your client app, we would listen for that order, right? And it's, that order needs to be, your record say you ordered 50 of them, right? And so when they put it on, if it didn't, you, as soon as they left the thing, it didn't match up, be, be keystroke or not, you would be notified that it didn't happen, right? Because th 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 there's just that single source of truth, you're sharing that data, you know, and, and, and the API to do all that kind of would be difficult to implement. Right now, if you're that global, if that order, that all, you know, that you have, you probably have a supply chain that's pretty common, I imagine, right? I mean, it's not just you, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 So what would happen is your association, your consortium would say, hey guys, listen, we all do this, we're all gonna save money, right? Because we're gonna put the order in, and then they're gonna put it on there, and if something goes wrong, it's instantly you know, Don't send trucks out, or you'll get a call, or say, whoa, 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 we said there, we wanted 50, and... There can probably be an agreement ahead of time with the consortium, right. that if, if at a certain point, the order is incorrect, Wherever that point, you know, wherever that happens, maybe that person's responsible. That would be a decision that the consortium would make. Right, but you would you would be able to rule or firm. Every the, and that's Everybody the transparency and the visibility that blockchain promises, right? That so you trust that's all going in there. And there's ways to hide information because it's a big thing that people bring up. Fabric has a way to organize organizations and blocks or transactions to say, ah, uh -uh, only these people can see this, right? For that kind of thing. So you wouldn't want people seeing your orders. Right? Yeah. Because other people. So mm -hmm. you can set it up to where you have an identity. So you and your competitor in supply chain, your vendor you're working with could see it, but they would. Mm -hmm. Right? So that fabric has that capability where you can say, yep, I need to know when you put that stuff in the truck and when they go from here, I need to see, I can look and see where that's at and that everything's in there. Now, if they type it in wrong, it's going to get caught. So you'll see it come across to the supply chain to you with all visibility. You can, that, that's what. Technologies there to do that quickly and without inventing it along the way or doing it on your own. Okay. So, and I think that's, I, that's, not, that's not a guess, that's what IBM's doing with, with um, you know, the ship, their shipping company and Walmart. They're just big enough boys to, to command that from the supply chain, right? I don't know how big you are, but if you said, you guys are all going to use this, they may or may not, right? Yeah. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess the point yeah. is, I guess, that it, tra it, it attracts the bill of lading, but it can't necessarily guarantee that each piece of lettuce came along with it. Like yeah. it, it can just it make the transparency. Well, but, but you'll, it, it can guarantee to you because you'll find out what for it didn't get there, right? right? Mm -hmm. in, in other words, if, if the first person makes a mistake and types in 50 and there's only 48 into it, the next one's got to make the same mistake, mm -hmm. right? Unlikely they won't, right? I guess you yeah. find where the issue is. Right. Well, then I guess resolve from there. Yeah, you'll know way ahead of time instead of it coming all the you and opening up the case. There's only 48 in here, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, what'll happen is uh, it'll, it'll, it's the same, same database being looked at by everybody, right, all the way through there. Okay. Sorry. Yes, sir, John, sorry, you were trying to chime in here. Um, yeah. My question is, can you in Fabric uh, set up like a, a fragment or a shard of the entire chain? In your flu example, you've got 200 countries on the planet. The United States is gonna have to store the entire blockchain, right? Not just for the United States, but for Canada, the United States. Huge population like China and India is Bangladesh, which is very poor, that store an entire blockchain for India and China and everybody else. Well, the answer to that I would use a channel. So Hyperledger has a notion of channels. So when I set up a peer node, when I set up a blockchain network, right, each machine, I can have as many channels as I want. And each channel is gonna be a ledger. Right? So I can have a US ledger channel, European. And they, they're not, they're different. They're not on the same so block right. store. They're separate chains that you call or whatever. That's one way to do it, okay? So I, I can have as many, I can have as many channels on a, on a, on a as I, within reason, on my one network. They're different block chains. Each channel is a separate chain, right? So I can, I can organize them that way. I set up a chain or channel and I can do it that way. So that's how, that's your case. However, I do think there's a way even within that um, to, to say only certain organizations will get this information because they had to do that for the example I talked about um, 
with the competitors, right? I mean, we can't have they can't have your orders, mm -hmm. right? ABC, ABC manufacturing can't see DES. It's not that'd be, that'd be a problem. You say, oh, go away! You're not going to see what you know. So they do have that kind of protection too, and permission where organizations can they can only comes to their machines. So it's not their business. So yes and yes, but the channel is the other organizing factor. I said, we're, we're, you know, I, I can't sit around here and say, you know, I'm talking about these supply chains, so I'm not, we're not out personally doing that, so I don't want to claim that we know, and I just did a lot of research, we stood up our own network, we're, we're applying it to the, the automation we're doing for enterprises now, a lot of reading, so I, I feel like it's still a, a technology that could play, and still will go back to the hardest part is the getting everybody on board, getting your manufacturing association on board, right? You could do it if you're big enough. You could say, hey, all my supply vendors, you participate in this. You could set up a network and make them do it if, you're, if you have enough weight. You know, they could do that. Or it might be better to, you know, whatever you're making or manufacturing, say, hey, let's all get together here and invest in this. We're all going to have more efficiencies and stuff like that. So it just depends on it. But you could, theoretically. I think as a replacement for EDI, forget about the consortiums and everything like that. If you have a big company and you want to share information with them, Instead of you standing up a centralized API server and backing it up and storing it out and call it, you could just have, give, them, give them a note. Hey, you know what? We got these nodes out here fired up. Here's your permission. As we do things, it's going to appear in your node. Talk to your node, right? It's distributed. Oh, another vendor, you know. So if I was had a product, like maybe I was giving out some kind of financial information or sharing stats or for insurance or whatever like that, I might, instead of setting up a normal way, an API or EDI call server that they all call, I might just say, you know what? Download this node. Here's your digital certificate. Fire it up. Here's a here's how you talk to it. I'm gonna put it out there. We got we got 30 vendor customers out there that all have this node, so I don't have to back it up. And we're just gonna go ahead and update this information. It'll disseminate out to all the people, and they can interact with it on their own, right? And I don't have to have them call my API. It's kind of the same thing, but I think it might be more resilient, and cheaper overall. Instead of having this giant, robust, centralized server, I use a distributed model, right? nodes out there and all my customers that are running their nodes for me on their EC2 or where they're running it, that's the, the network up and running and they get, get a way to get it in pretty quick fact, push to them. And it's push to them too. It's not, you know, they don't have to work their own push, you know, a mechanism from an API. So it's, it does the same thing, but I, I think that's a, a possible play for blockchain technology um, uh, as opposed to the, the centralized server. Deal. John, your question though, is it a lot cheaper? I don't know. I've done it yet. I, my, my gut tells me it's cheaper. I don't have to have so much stuff, but I haven't done it yet, so I can't guarantee you that. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's kind of the pitch we have. We'll do another one. I mean, I'm open to, we, we won't have a meetup probably in, in January, February. You know, it's it's kind of got to be a fabric API and all of that. Is that available for free or do I have to register with IP? For free. For free. Oh, um, everything's free. So you go to, to get fabric, get fabric itself. So first off, IBM didn't donate anymore. They they donated to Linux Foundation. So I always say IBM because they were the original authors of it, but they don't own it anymore. Uh, they have their they they forked it and maybe done some of their own stuff. But Hyperledger Fabric is an open source um, uh, platform, free. Everything's free, and it's um, gut stewarded by the Linux Foundation. You can download it, and it's 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 underneath. So Fabric is a framework underneath. Um, and there you go, it's good. It's first network, everything's free. It's, um, it's Hyperledger is the blockchain um, uh, entity underneath the Linux Foundation, and then Fabric is the framework under Hyperledger. So it's really called Hyperledger Fabric, or HLF. That's this, but they have all kinds of, um, this is Fabric, Hyperledger has all, you know, saw tools, all kinds of blockchain solutions out here. This, this is the, this is the Hyperledger umbrella. This is uh, Burrow, permissible smart contracts, Hyperledger fabrics that we're talking about. Uh, there's decentralized identity. Sawtooth is a is a, is a competitor. That, that's a different blockchain implementation than Fabric. I don't know much about it, but this is this is all underneath. Um, it's all free, so check that out. They have some um, interoperability between Ethereum and Hyperledger. There's some frameworks so we interoperate. That's a big deal. Theoretically, all these blockchain networks make their way out there. Interop's going to could be a big deal, right? Well, wait a minute, we're using Ethereum, or we're using Sawtooth, or we're using, and they're already talking about transactions uh, across 
good place to go. Uh, Hyperledger dot org. So I think enterprise data sharing is the is the is the killer app. It's a different way to look at it. It's a distributed, trustable way to share. You get to charge for it, do whatever you want for it, right? Um, but most everybody now is setting up APIs, centralized API servers that are clustered and redundant that people are calling. That works. What about using a more distributed model like Napster or BitTorrent, the same kind of premise? It scales better, it is more resilient, and the blockchain technology makes it trustworthy. So that's where I, that's where I think it's if I was in the software business or I had some kind of information sharing, I would be considered that you know, as a way to do it, not a way instead of sending a bunch of infrastructure to, to I might just you know, let the network itself be the, the balancing act of the other, you know, you know keep, it, keep it stable. So yeah, thanks for coming. We'll get something out in January, getting an idea to shoot them our way, but spending a lot of time in it, playing with it and doing it. Um, I'm, I'm technical, so I like going to the technical stuff. I get a lot of questions on business side of things, so I'd be off. Really interested in anybody that wants to have some insight on that. Is I'm, I'm always going to go towards the, the code because that's what I like to do. But uh, that's what we do. But, um, how we got started a while ago, which it, it's all free. It, you, it's get, start your first network. Basically, what you do is you bring a whole, it, start up a whole network on your machine, right? It uses Docker, right? So you start it up, you got everything you need right there, and that's how I did it. That's not reality. I mean, you don't, you don't the network, but. It, Start it all up, and you see how the smart contracts work. You see how you get a feel for all these technologies, um, and that's how we did it. And it, it's pretty straightforward. So I would, if you're technical, that's what I do. I was reading about Ethereum. They said that Hyperledger was a permissioned blockchain. What does that mean, permission? Everybody has to have a um, digital certificate, uh, public and private key, to access the network. You can't get so Bitcoin. Are you guys familiar with Bitcoin? Um, all, you don't, anybody can see it, anybody can access it, anybody can execute transaction. There's, there's no permission. Nobody has to give you something. You just, you, you generate your own um, uh, private key, anybody can in the world, and then they can execute transactions. Anybody. There's no the open access to the world. Fabric can't do that. If I'm a supply chain and I want to go ahead and, and look at the database or put things in the database, from a certificate authority, somebody has to give me, somebody has to give me a digital certificate, public private key that gets produced. They have they have a firm that is custodian of the network. They're okay. standing up the nodes on behalf of the other entities, and they're the ones who are authorized to say, um, yes, this organization can be into it, therefore I'll out of band generate a public private key and give them a private key. If you lose the private key, you're out. So it's, it's PKI, it's public key encryption, right? They have that private key, right, and that digital certificate, then it's them. Now if somebody steals it, then it's, then you can't get it. Fabric has very robust um, access control. Who can read transactions, who can write transactions? There's a whole labyrinth of how you want to set that up. You can make it really simple. Admins and users, or if you want to get, this organization can do this, this user can do that, it can do that. Very highly tuned permissions. It's in there. So you can very granular too. So you, it's all that's where we figure it's a permission base. But they've thought about all the. We don't want this organization. But this organization can execute transactions. This one can only read them, but they can't execute. You can configure all that in the network, as opposed to a public blockchain, which you know anybody can do anything, and it's just you know it's like Bitcoin. And, and it's not. That's how it has to be. It's all permission. That's why businesses like it, right? Because they've got to have that uh, identity and permission. They need to know who's doing it, who's operating on it. We had a, a couple of meetings we talked about how Hyperledger works, and we can talk about that some more too at some point if you want to. But I would, I think by going out and there's lots and lots of stuff on it here. See, on, on now of course the biggest killer app is cryptocurrency for it, right? Yeah. But um, I really believe there's some a play in it for information sharing. Thanks for coming. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, hope you're proud.